Rachel Maddow of Air America, do you take phone calls on your program? Sometimes, not all the time. I do a um, two-hour show, and uh, it's pretty uh, it, it's pretty fast moving. We cover more than thirty news stories over the course of the two hours, and so um, on issues where there's. Um, I guess more heat than light, where there's more emotion than there is information to talk about. When people need to express themselves and 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 say how they feel about particular issues, for example, on the day that uh, President Bush commuted Scooter Libby's sentence, there's not that much in more information to impart about that. But it created a huge wellspring of of emotion um, among people who were angered by that by that decision by President Bush. And so that's the kind of day where we would open the phones and let's let's talk about how you feel about this. Let's talk about how the country ought to respond to this sort of development. So we do it on a on an issue by issue basis, but not every day. Molly Loftus emails in while you're the first person I have heard voice the Jeb Bush theory, which had been worrying me for a while. <laughs> could you support really? a could you support a unity O eight candidate like Michael Bloomberg? Should our worst fear come true and it would be Democrat Hillary Clinton against Republican Jeb Bush? <laughs> ah! <laughs> um, <clears throat> I um, live in New York uh, at least part of the time because I do my show from New York for Air America. And um, as a mayor, I think that Mike Bloomberg's a pretty good mayor. I think that Mike Bloomberg is a way better mayor than Rudy Giuliani was, for example. Um, I think that you know I don't I don't agree with him on everything, but I think he's been a competent guy at the helm of New York City, and he's a Republican, or at least he was. Now he's an independent. Whether that would translate into being a good president. Maybe it would. I wouldn't be, I mean, I, I don't recoil at the idea of it. I am a little grossed out by the prospect of a, a, a billionaire several times over um, being able to run the country both officially and unofficially, since I think billionaires kind of run the country <laughs> off, the, off the radar screen a little bit. So having one in the Oval Office might be a little distracting. I think it's part of, the, part of my reaction against Mitt Romney as well. In terms of um, whether it could be uh, Clinton v. Bush again, I, I think it could be Clinton v. Bush again. I, I will clarify my, my theory about Jeb Bush. I will admit it. It is a uh, conspiracy theory, and it has it has. It's not like I've heard a tip somewhere that this is going to happen. It's mostly based on my feeling that none of the people on the Republican side, none of these guys who are who are supposedly the top tier candidates on the Republican side, seem even remotely electable to me. And and that doesn't just give me comfort because I feel like. Republicans are too on the ball in terms of electoral strategy to run somebody who doesn't have a chance of getting elected. And I just don't think that Giuliani or, or Romney or Fred Thompson or any of these guys actually has a chance of winning. And so I can't imagine they're going to let any of those guys be the nominee. Joe Montana, Essex, Connecticut, emails, how does your guest perceive the terrorist threat? How would she characterize it? Does she see it as a significant threat? If not, why? If yes, how would she suggest the U.S. combat it? That's a great question, and I think that's the question of um, of our decade thus far, and probably of the next uh, next two or three to come. I see the terrorist threat as very real. Um, I see terrorism um, not as an existential threat to this country because I don't think that um, I don't I don't think that uh, America is susceptible to um, t to the terrorist threat in a way that would threaten our very existence as a nation. I don't see this as a world war scenario. I see terrorists essentially as 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 politically and religiously driven criminals, and I think that Al Qaeda is is a is an organized crime network um, that's driven by um, overblown um, and and religiously the theologically suspect perverted view of Islam. I think that we'd be more effective in fighting Al Qaeda if we treated them as criminals rather than treating them as if they're some sort of army, they're some sort of soldiers. I think that the construct of the war on terror simply aggrandizes Al Qaeda and increases the um, appeal of their message and their tactics for people who might otherwise think of them as kooks, which they are. So I think that we did them a big favor by declaring war on them, and then so simultaneously not actually going after them in any effective way, diverting resources from Afghanistan to start this tangential, unrelated war in Iraq, bogging down our military in such huge numbers and for such an enormous amount of time in Iraq, which has nothing to do with Al Qaeda and 9/11 and the group that attacked us. I see the the, the threat of Al Qaeda and people inspired by the same messianic nihilism. 
as 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 real and as um, as something that is a, a huge challenge for the United States and that could be potentially um, uh, you know, we could face something worse than 9/11 in in the near future. Absolutely, that that's the kind of thing that. Um, I think all Americans agree on. Nobody thinks this isn't a problem. The question, and I think the place that there are some interesting fault lines and disagreements, is on how to best fight it. I think the war on terror has been a failure at fighting al-Qaeda. They're better off and we're worse off. That's failure. I think that um, we, it, when, when we lost our allies because of, the, um, because of the way we went into Iraq, because of the, the misleading statements that brought us there, because of the behavior of the, of the Bush administration about Iraq, we lost probably our best chance of getting at al-Qaeda because we lost our international legitimacy. And ultimately, it may not be as chest beatingly macho and politically exciting to uh, say that you're going to go get these guys arrested through international police cooperation and, di- and diplomacy with, with nations that we need to build alliances with. It may not be as, mm-hmm. as politically uh, salient, but I think it would be more effective at, at actually rooting them out and, uh, and getting them brought to justice. Springfield, Florida, about three minutes left with our guest. Hi, Rachel. Um, I'm not familiar with your talk show, but I would really love to be. Um, I'm in Springfield, Florida, <laughs> and I understand, you know, wanting uh, to vote for the uh, Democrats because I myself, I used to be one as well, but now I'm a Republican, and I also noticed that you mentioned the Constitution. Um, out of our Republican candidates, I know that there's only been one to ever actually bring that up. And I also know that the war is really scary right now, and I understand how you feel about that as well. And I do, too, and I know a lot of Americans are scared about the war right now and that it's not going to get any better. But I just also, you know, wanted to ask you if you were aware that Ron Paul was the only candidate who voted against the war. And uh, also, too, how do you feel about him um, wanting the Constitution, you know, to take place so we can get our country back together, you know, and we can get us united again, you know, like we used to be. And our forefathers were right when they created the Constitution. And if we abide by that, then I think actually we can probably get out of the situation we're in now. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I have to say, watching the Republican debates, and I've watched them all on the end of my seat because I'm a political nerd and I find this stuff fascinating no matter who's talking. It's been great to hear Ron Paul saying that I'm the the candidate who will stand up for the Constitution and that, no, I wouldn't do anything that was against the Constitution, and then that's got to be our fundamental guiding principle. I'm happy to hear that from any candidate, and for him to be saying it at the Republican debates um, (laughs) against the backdrop of how this current Republican president has... Um, I think in a lot of ways uh, abuse the Constitution uh, has been really refreshing. I don't, um, I don't support Ron Paul's candidacy because I think that his, uh, his libertarianism is not what the country uh, needs right now and I respect people who come at things from a libertarian perspective but I don't, I'm not, uh, that's not where I come from and I also feel like it's weird to have a libertarian who believes that the government ought to ensure that women carry all their pregnancies to term because if you don't... <laughs> If you don't believe in government intrusion, the idea that the government should intrude on your decisions about your pregnancy, I, I, I think, is a, little, is, is a little hard to take. So I'm not supporting Ron Paul for president, but I'm really, really glad that he's in the race and he's getting as much attention as he is. Last call for Rachel Maddow, Indianapolis, Independent. Yes, hi there. I'm wondering why there's such a duopoly in this country, Democrat and Republican. The Green Party is... Uh, uh, a much better platform, much more humane, and much more uh, that would make the country more secure. Uh, we are stuck in this uh, thing, Democrat and Republican. Well, both parties have failed. They serve the same corporate masters. I'd like to know what your thoughts on that are. I think that, um, that for example, the candidacy of Ralph Nader uh, could have been turned to great effect if instead of running for president again, Nader had decided to get to try to get the whole country onto instant runoff voting or one of the other voting systems that it lets third parties be something other than a spoiler that really lets them take some power uh, without taking away from the other candidates, the other parties that they're uh, most similar to. And so I, I think that we're moving toward greater party for third power, the greater power for third parties would be a great thing. And I think that reforming the voting system to include things like instant runoff voting to get rid of the spoiler effect would be the way, to, the way to really physically, substantively get there. Rachel Maddow, Air America, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's been our guest for the last hour. Thank you for being on C-SPAN. I hope you'll come back. Thank you, Peter. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. Half hour left.